turning into the afternoon, depending on where in the world you are. Um, my name is Libby Bischoff, and for those of you who don't know me, I am the executive director of the Osher Map Library and Smith Center for Cartographic Education. And today we are so pleased to be able to welcome our own Dr. Matthew Edney for a presentation entitled, What the Bleeper Maps? <laughs> Trying to Write the History of Cartography. And I will introduce Matthew to you all in just a few minutes. Um, this map lunch series is a little bit more intimate than our Zoom webinar programming. Um, and so it's a bit of a, a, it's a large crowd, but it's still a bit of a, a smaller crowd than on our, our evening programs. And that's intentional. Um, it's really to feature works in progress, feature discussions um, about process from cartographers and artists, map historians, geographers, curators, and really anyone who's interested about geospatial issues writ large. And so before we begin, uh, not that we need it nearly two years into the pandemic, but just a couple of Zoom housekeeping reminders. Uh, we are recording today's session uh, for those who can't be with us this afternoon. Um, and you'll want to mute your mics if they're not already for the duration of Matthew's presentation. And while he's presenting, you'll likely want to choose speaker view, which you can do by toggling the view button at the top of your screen. Um, when we go into the Q&A, you're welcome to go into gallery view, which might be a bit more useful. I will look forward to moderating the Q&A at the end with Matthew. Um, you, can, you are more than welcome to put your questions in the chat during the duration of the program, um, but we will have our Q&A for Matthew um, after his presentation. And we're very much looking forward to a robust conversation. Before I go ahead and introduce my dear colleague, I would like to share our land acknowledgement here at the Math Library. And so this afternoon, we offer a land acknowledgement for Machigan, the truest name in Maliseet poet Miku Paul's words of the now called city of Portland, Maine, where the Osher Map Library and Smith Center for Cartographic Education sits on the campus of the University of Southern Maine. We sit on land that was once water and once part of a water-based ecosystem, which for thousands of years before the French or the English set foot on the neck, provided for the indigenous peoples of the Dawn land, the Wabanaki, and those who are here from the beginning in kinship with the land and with the water. We acknowledge this truth this afternoon as we acknowledge the contemporary presence and sovereignty of the Abenaki, Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, Mi'kmaq and Maliseet peoples, the Wabanaki Confederacy, and as we acknowledge the devastation of settler colonialism past and present. We acknowledge and we invite you to do the same this afternoon if you wish, that a land acknowledgement, no matter how sincerely offered, is only a beginning to our collective work. And so with that, thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce our presenter this afternoon, Dr. Matthew Edney, Professor of Geography here at the University of Southern Maine, where he teaches a great variety of courses in map history. He is also the Osher Chair in the History of Cartography and very helpfully for all of us sitting in this building, the faculty scholar in residence at the Osher Map Library and Smith Center. He is also, as many of you on the call know, the director of the History of Cartography Project at the University of Wisconsin, where he and his team are currently hard at work on volume five, which will be on cartography in the 19th century. As a 19th century historian, that is the one that I am most awaiting. Um, listing Matthew's many accolades <laughs> would take me the duration of this lunch, so I will just share that he has recently been named this year's Distinguished Fellow by the Society for the History of Discoveries, which was quite an honor, and that his most recent book is Cartography, The Ideal and Its History, published by the University of Chicago Press in 2019. We are so delighted to have Matthew with us today to share his work in progress for this lunchtime series. And without further ado, Matthew, I'm gonna turn it right over to you. Thank you, Libby. Um, and thank you everybody for joining. We're up to 56 people, that's quite good. I saw some really good friends in the list of participants and some complete strangers, so welcome. Um, what the bleep are maps? And it is doing this very annoying thing. It may not be annoying, 
people are waiting to be admitted and it gets in the way of forwarding screens. Anyway, so as Libby said, uh, we are part of the Ocean Map Library and Smith Center for Cartographic Education at University of Southern Maine. We do all sorts of fun stuff. Um, you hear, you know about us, I'm not going to go on about this. Uh, I will just also note, Libby said, I direct the History of Cartography Project for my sins. Um, here's the Full Array, Volume 4, uh, 2019, European Enlightenment. I edited with the wonderful Mary Pedley, who I believe is present today. And we are now working on our last volume, Volume 5, Cartography in the, in the 19th Century, edited by Roger Kane. And I just want to add, given it's this time of year, that um, if you wish to see Volume 5 come out promptly, um, please give. We need uh, more money. Uh, we're getting into the utterly um, unsexy parts of volume preparation that funders don't really necessarily like. And so we are very much interested in private donations. Just go to geography.wist.edu slash hiscart and follow the links if you wish to Give us $25, $25,000, anything in between, I don't care. Thank you. Uh, and I will say that if you don't know, um, the History of Cartography Project uh, is slowly going online. Um, four volumes, one, two, three, and six are online at the University of Chicago Press. And three, uh, four and five will go online within three years of print publications. So 2023 for volume four and whenever volume five gets done. I'm not gonna give a date because I've been uh, called out on that too many times. So what the bleep are maps? Um, this is really a statement, uh, sort of a, a indication of how this current project came about, how it's going, where I'm going. I'm not gonna get too much into the precise details. Um, if I did that, there are hundreds of thousands of words I've written on this thing, uh, much of which I've already farmed out into various places. Um, so I don't wanna get caught up in the, in the minutia, uh, but feel free to ask questions at the end if you have any, any uh, precise uh, concerns. Um, I just wanna give you a broad idea of where this project has, has, has taken me over the last 10 years or so. So how the project came about? Well, you know, the ultimate origin of the project um, was in June, 2011, when I went to uh, the wedding of my nephew Piers and his wife, Emma, uh, which took place in June, 2011, and which meant I had to go to Europe a full month before I would have gone to the Moscow conference of the International uh, conference on history of cartography and so I therefore took the opportunity to go to a conference uh, called the language of maps hosted by organized by Nick Milley of Oxford and uh, Keith Lilly of uh, Queen's University Belfast and it was held in this beautiful space the convocation house within the Bodleian library it was the first originally built in the early 17th century to house a whole new uh, stack of books on the east end of the building. Got refurbished in the 18th century with this wonderful ceiling. Seats that are uh, literally to die for. You better take cushions if you're gonna sit there for any length of time. A very, very painful seating. But anyway, um, and this conference was, was the culmination of uh, a long period of study um, by Nick and Keith uh, in their linguistic geographies project, which is now all online. Um, that was really investigating um, the Gough map, circa 1400 map of Britain on vellum that Richard Gough had collected, where well, he acquired it from another collector and gave it to the Bodleian in the early 19th century. Um, and they're trying to figure out from the evidence of the place names of the toponymy, uh, something about the history of this, of this map. And as part of this project, they had a number of advisors, uh, Paul Harvey, who does a lot of medieval maps, Peter Barber, who's just sort of genius of map history in Britain. And then the third keynote, the third sort of advisor, and therefore their, the, their third keynote speaker, was a man called Jeremy Smith, who 
um, is a historical linguist at the University of Glasgow. Um, he's done a lot of, lot of very interesting stuff. And his keynote, which really wasn't about maps, it was about language, really confirmed for me some ideas that I'd had um, about the nature of linguistic communities, the nature of dialects, the dialects are not perversions of some pure language, but rather they're just a linguistic community. And only some linguistic communities at different times um, have sufficient economic and political power that their particular version of a language uh, will be uh, a dominant, um, you know, what is now, for example, the, the Queen's English in, uh, in Britain. Um, and so because this sort of fed into some of my ideas about maybe thinking about groups of map making as equivalent in some way to linguistic communities, this is all sort of, but, ah, yeah, this, this sort of works. And so I looked at what else Jeremy Smith has written. And in particular, I found out that he had written uh, a book called An Historical Study of English, um, which basically is, is not a history of English, of the English language, much to the annoyance of all the reviews that I've read of it. Uh, but rather it poses the question, how do we understand the nature of, of the English language such that we can tell its history effectively, um, but we can actually account for change um, and form and in fun form and function as you go through uh, from the Anglo-Saxon period through the early, uh, through the Middle Ages with a with a Norman influence into the modern English eventually. And it made me think, can I do the same thing for cartography? Can I do a book called An Historical Understanding of Cartography? And this I thought would take um, three parts. Uh, one part would be sort of the problem. What is the nature of cartography? And then this would allow me to talk about the effects of the problem, how history of cartography has been told in line with the assumed nature of cartography. And that this in turn would then offer a solution, which is understanding mapping as sets of processes um, coming out of the, uh, the resolution of the problem. Um, in the end, however, uh, I, I have to say, if you don't know my work, uh, I have a habit of using my writing as a way to think through concepts and develop ideas. And so as I write and as I work, uh, the writing projects tend to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And they become more and more and more unwieldy. Uh, and so in the end, I decided, uh, let's just focus first on <laughs> what is the nature of cartography. And this is an especially important um, uh, issue because um, whenever anybody in the last 200 years has sought to define what is cartography, there's always an immediate act of, of misdirection or redirection because cartography is presumed to be what is map making. So therefore, the scope of cartography is defined by the map. And so the all definitions of cartography proceed in two steps. As the first step, cartography is map making in some way, maps are these. So the British Cartographic Society in 1964 laid out a definition of what is a map, uh, which was adopted by the uh, International Cartographic Association as well a few years later, in which they say that Cartography is the art, science, and technology of making all kinds um, of maps together with the study of maps as scientific documents and works of art. And in this context, maps may be regarded as including all types of maps. Yay, how's that for a little Freudian slip? Plans, charts, and sections, three-dimensional models and globes representing the earth or, or any heavenly body at any scale. So this classic two-stage um, 
definition. My goal in the first book, oh, and I, yeah, this is a very annoying thing. For some reason, my slides are advancing twice whenever I um, hit once. <laughs> so, so my goal was to try and break this pattern and to treat cartography as an historical phenomenon. After all, the world, the word itself was only coined in 1808 by a, a Danish political emigre in Paris, Conrad Mountbrun, um, who had a very, very particular concept for the word. Um, how the word then gets adopted had, um, shows that people had different concepts of what was meant by this new, this new term, this neologism, cartography. And eventually it forced me uh, to break out of very long established intellectual habits, which is a very hard thing to do. Um, and every time I look back on this, I keep thinking, my God, how stupid was I not to have seen this earlier? It's just really digging through a great deal of intellectual baggage to, to, to get out of the intellectual rut. It's just very hard to do. So eventually I realized that cartography is actually, it's not a thing, it's not a process, not an endeavor, but it's a web of idealizations, cultural beliefs that has actually nothing valid to say about how people go about producing, circulating and consuming maps. And academics and map historians and, and professionals have spent a great deal of their time in the last 200 years trying to live up to the ideal, trying to make cartography real. But at the same time, they've been going about doing mapping in the old kinds of ways. And so what I realized is that um, cartography, this, this, this web of belief, comprises about 10 preconceptions, each sustaining a host of convictions um, that might be valid and often are valid but only for specific kinds of mapping, modes of mapping in very particular contexts. And when you look at the entirety of cartography as cartography is presumed to be this, this broad universal endeavor, it just doesn't match at all what people actually do in producing, circulating and consuming maps. <clears throat> and one key conviction um, of the ideal coming out of these preconceptions is that there is only ever just one category of things called maps. If cartography is gonna be a universal um, endeavor of map making, then map is itself a universal singular concept. So <clears throat> there we go. We have then, um, my idea for an historical understanding of cartography. Cartography itself is um, itself a, a problem. And so the overall project uh, became retitled in my head and historical understanding of mapping. The first part, the problem, what is the nature of cartography became the book that Libby mentioned in 2019. Um, and then the second book, um, is very much uh, now it sort of began as the, the, the history of map history. How has history of cartography been written in line with the assumed nature of cartography? That's where I began the second book. So trying to write the history of map histories is not straight, it's not easy. Um, but it appealed to me because it's, it's summarizing work I've been doing for a long time, mostly in, in originally in, in the context of the legacies of my, my two mentors, Brian Harley and my graduate advisor, David Woodward. Both of these gentlemen um, pursued different kinds of work uh, that really does actually challenge the apparent unity of the history of cartography that they themselves were preaching. It's a wonderful paradox. Um, and it goes into a very long, <laughs> very long detailed argument as to why this was the case. So on the one hand, um, 
Harley was interested in uh, the substance of particular kinds of early maps, like this, these details from the Burdett survey of uh, Cheshire, 1777. Uh, Harley is what we could call a, a substantive map historian, somebody interested in reconstructing past landscapes and social relations that, that are grounded in the landscape. And these guys would produce, um, among other things, analytical maps showing, in this case, um, by Harley and his student Paul Laxton, a map of the distribution of water mills and windmills on the Burdett map to get a sense of the growth of industrialization, the growth of rural industry as a prelude to the uh, coal based later industrialization we think of. Um, very, very crucial kind of study for historical geographers like Harley. On the other hand, David Woodward was interested in how mapping practices affect the look of maps, the, the physical form, the graphic structure, the graphic image. I was especially interested in the relationship of map, early map printing techniques and how you letter maps between woodcut, copper engraving, um, and so on. So his master's thesis was on uh, woodblock cutting and letter, pardon me, lettering. His PhD published in 1977, focused on this process called serography or wax engraving, uh, in which, um, well, the technique is irrelevant at this point, but it, it, it allows for a very heavy, um, a very dense, typographically dense map. Uh, and it establishes an aesthetic that's fairly unique to the USA where this technique was used. It really wasn't used in Europe. Um, and it gives an aesthetic that perpetuates right up into the 20th century, uh, even to this day, if you, if you know your National Geographic maps, uh, they stem from this process in terms of this aesthetic. So um, a completely different kind of uh, map history that's concerned with the practices of map making. How do map makers work to create a particular kind of look, a final product. And this is very much a professional map history, what we can call an internal map history, um, various, various reasons. And both of these kinds of work were in addition to the dominant kind of map history, the kind of map history that most map historical work um, is concerned with, which I'm calling traditional map history. Um, and this is the, the history of um, geographical mapping, marine mapping as a, uh, as a surrogate for the rise of European empire, for the rise of nations, and of, in fact, of all Western civilization. Um, and it's exemplified in this Arrowsmith map of North America uh, that was used in terms of planning more explorations to learn more geographic information that would then be re in integrated back into the, the map of uh, North America, of US in particular. After 1980, <clears throat> Harley and Woodward uh, championed and especially Harley, championed a new kind of what we can call socio-cultural map history from the perspective that maps are cultural texts and social instruments. And so the, the, um, the poster child of this new approach is the reinterpretation of this map, the Hereford Mapa Mundi from the 13th century. Traditionally, this map has been um, held up as uh, monstrous, barbaric, childish, uh, as showing um, just 
uh, a flat earth, the old world in, on, in, as a disc, as a flat disc that seemed to be symbolic of a regressive medievalism that had either forgotten about uh, the ancient triumphs of Ptolemy and the Greeks or just didn't know about them and represent a completely different kind of mapping. Um, sociocultural map historians, on the other hand, um, started to look at these maps as very rich social cultural documents. And so in the case of the Hereford map of Mundi, you, they, people start paying attention to the representation at the very top of the second of the final judgment where Christ is sending people uh, to hell, which is on the right of this image as we look at it, or to heaven as on the left. Um, and just below, within just within the, 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 the limb of the circle of the earth, there's a little circle, which is the Garden of Eden, uh, and so on. You've got biblical information. Here's the Tower of Babel, um, as it was before God leveled it. Uh, and also you have uh, information coming out of uh, Roman Greek secular sources uh, around the right hand limb is the images of the so-called monstrous races. Here are a couple of headless feature, uh, figures um, and so on. So, <clears throat> so the second book under this sort of sense of uh, how people have studied maps, how people have studied the history of maps, with what kind of theories, uh, became a new book called Maps History Theory. It's got several parts talking about, you know, early modern inter uh, intersections of maps and history, then traditional internal substantive and sociocultural map histories, uh, leading up to a final uh, statement about processual map history, uh, which would point to the putative third book of this series, which I was thinking of as mapping as process. Makes sense, I think. Except there's still a big problem. Um, sociocultural map historians just could not define map in a succinct and logical way. Um, and in large part, it's because they still have to, they still end up referring to the idealized formal map uh, of the ideal of cartography. So for example, academic cartographers and practitioners have continued to hold in the face of the social cultural work that maps are my favorite phrase, uh, depleted homologues of the earth's surface. Whereas social culturally minded scholars like Hardy and Woodward have argued instead that maps are graphic representations that facilitate a spatial understanding of things, concepts, conditions, processes, or events in the human world. I just have to say that even though this last quotation is frequently uh, reiterated, um, you go to, a, to a, an interdisciplinary uh, symposium, and at some point, discussion is going to just run to a halt. It's going to grind to a halt. And somebody's going to say, so what is a map anyway? I mean, it happens every single conversation. Um, we still have no clear concept. Social cultural map studies has not helped us define what the map is. So over time, um, I started thinking about quite different concepts of, of um, different kinds of map histories, different kinds of map studies, which led to a quite different kind of um, title for the second book. Uh, now it's going to be called, in a very clunky title, Understanding Maps and Map History, Concepts and Practices of a Disjointed Field. Fine. But there's still problems. First problem, sociocultural map historians continue to, to define their subject matter around the same kinds of maps that map historians have always studied. It's a very fundamental uh, problem I've struggled with for, for years. How do you define a culturally critically valid kind of map study 
if you're still structuring that study around older, outdated kinds of uh, map history. And we can see that um, in the use of uh, a very annoying back formation that I used to like, but I've decided that I don't like it anymore, um, called cartograph. This is a word that is used um, starting in the 20s and 30s to refer to a new genre of pictorial maps um, that are called cartograph as a back formation from cartography uh, to mean the thing produced by cartography in the same sense that a photograph is produced by photography. And it was consciously adopted as a way to distinguish these fun maps that are consciously playing with, uh, with the conventions of modern mapping, normative mapping. Uh, and turning them into something fun and different and not really maps, they're maps, but not real maps. And this practice has continued um, after the after 1980 into social cultural period, when scholars have taken works that are not strictly speaking maps in the sense of a measured statement of the Earth's surface and have called them cartographs, whether it's a bird's eye view, uh, a thematic map of um, trying to figure out where to place uh, post offices in Paris or uh, the maps of, sorry, native peoples, indigenous peoples. All of these have been called cartographs uh, in the recent literature. All of which are saying, well, these are maps, but they're not real maps. There's something different. There's you know, so, we, so we've got this little tension here. We want maps still to be real in that, in that sort of kind of factual, depleted homologue kind of way. Why is this taking all this time? So we're... So the second key problem is that everybody still wants to define a single definition for map. Um, and it's sort of like the nominal fallacy. Uh, the idea that if you if you know the name of something, you know what that thing is, and all this history and, and nature and stuff. Um, for us, it's more the question of maps. Are, if if we can just bracket this thing lexico lexicographically, we'll know it. We can we can then study it and, and pursue our work. Um, and I just have to say, this is very similar to the addendum. Uh, to one of my favorite songs um, about boogie music by Canned Heat. Um, presenting this song to the world, we must then explain it, justify our position by formulating a definition of boogie music and setting forth its main principles in such a way that all may understand instantly that their souls, their lives, and every relation with every other human being in every circumstance depends on boogie music and the right comprehension and right application thereof. If only we can define the map properly and coherently, we'll be set. We can, we can figure it all out from there. That's sort of underlying this whole recent work in map history. A third problem that some academic cartographers have noticed is that those brief lexicographical definitions are all inadequate. They're, they're, they're a very succinct statement of what people want maps to be. They want the ideal to actually exist. In the 1990s, a few scholars adopted um, a, a body of thought from linguists called prototype theory. Uh, in, in the linguistic concept, uh, a prototype is a category that is not hard and fast. Membership is defined by conceptual proximity to a prototype. And if things fall close enough to that prototype, then they're, they're part of that category. And if they lie beyond the threshold, then they're not part of that category. And so the scholars were trying to figure out, can we use this to make them to define map in a more nuanced manner? Now, for, for linguists, the key issue was um, both how do you define the prototype and how do you define the, the boundary conditions. So consider the thing called a chair. 
this is definitely a chair. I think everybody uh, listening will agree with me on that. Here's a man sitting on a rock. You sit on a chair, he's sitting on a rock. Is this rock a chair? I think everybody would say, no, it's not. There's, there's, it's, it's, it has some aspects, it's a seat, but it's not man-made, it's not lifted off the ground uh, and so on. It's, it doesn't have the attributes that we would like of chairness of the prototype chair. Would a milking stool, three-legged milking stool be considered a chair? And here I would, I, I, I completely guess, but I would think that some people out there uh, listening would say, yes, it is a chair. And other people might say, no, it's not. Uh, and that becomes the point of interest to linguists. Why do some, why would some people put a stair in a, a stool in the chair category? And why would people, some people, other people would exclude it. And what then does that say about how languages form and develop and get used and so on? So with that, <clears throat> with that in mind, um, we have these attempts in the 90s to use prototype theory to um, try to make a more nuanced definition of map. A map as a broad category, it doesn't have to be a hard and fast thing but a broad category of things that somehow relate to a prototype um, and that have a threshold beyond which you don't have maps. What's interesting, and I'm, I'm showing um, Adam McEachran's um, concept of this redone as a, as a field of uh, two axes, one of scale, one of abstraction. Um, but nonetheless, all maps fall within this field. What maps individual, maps people would define as a prototype would vary based on the experience of the people. A student at school might say that the prototypical map would be a world political map, the kind of maps they see on classroom walls. Whereas uh, an officer in the army would likely say the prototype map is a topographical terrain map, the kind of map that they use daily in their business of trying to move troops and tanks and so on across landscapes. Um, but for McEachern, nonetheless, all of these kinds of maps fall close to the center of these axes in this conceptual field. But in thinking about the different kinds of map history, I finally realized about 12 months ago that when one set of scholars, map scholars, are talking about maps. They're actually meaning a significantly different thing um, than what other groups of scholars mean when they say maps, when they talk about maps. So Brian Harley, as a substantive map historian, when he was writing in the 60s and 70s in particular, and talking about maps, he primarily was referring to these kinds of maps, detailed maps. This is, one's, this is the whole map of Cheshire by Burdett. Um, at relatively large scales, one inch to a mile, one to 63, 360, that you can interrogate for their information about past landscapes and so on. This can be called uh, the surveyed map, maps that are uh, ideally algorithmic reductions. You just follow the rules and you'll take a survey and you'll shrink it down to this kind of map um, without much, I mean, in practice, there's tons of human intervention, but the surveyed map concept sort of is, is ideally algorithmic. By contrast, David Woodward was working within uh, modern academia, modern academic cartography and his concern for uh, what can be called abstract maps. An abstract map is a map that is designed by humans, that it is a humanly mediated image. And this is very much at the core of most North American uh, cartographic studies in academia after the Second World War. Um, and the example here is uh, Albrecht Penck's um, map of the uh, map of German ethnic and cultural lands, which looks 
oh so factual but is actually uh very inconsistent in how it shows different kinds of different groups of areas to to promote the sense of a uh, single uh, german territory a sim single german folk um and i should say this is often treated as being a nazi kind of map but Penck's work was actually repudiated by the Nazis because it didn't support, uh, their, ultimately didn't support their ideologies. And then traditional map historians have always been interested in these kinds of maps showing the growth of geographical knowledge over time. We can call this kind of map, the synoptic map. A map is a, a, a world or regional map that summarizes the society's accumulated geographical knowledge. It's like a snapshot of where a society has gotten to in its knowledge of the world. And by arraying these kinds of maps in sequence, you can see the growth of geographical knowledge, the growth of nations, the growth of empires, the growth of civilization. All this is to say, there is no platonic form or ideal of the map. Scholars do not study maps according to their nature. This is the realization that kicked me out of yet another intellectual rut. Rather, the nature of maps is defined by how scholars study them. This is a complete inversion of so much of what we, we do as map scholars. Um, as I said, this has been very, very slow to gel. It's only been in the last 12 months, in many respects, only in the last six months, that this has actually come together in a way that I'm actually comfortable with now and happy with. Um, so now, ha, I have yet another new title. Maybe I'm hoping it's the final title for the book. When it's finally done, it's going to be called The Map, Concepts and Histories. Yay. So the idea is that, um, is that right? Yeah. Um, when you look at the different schools of map history, the different historiographical modes of map history, um, each one has promoted a particular conception of what we generically call maps. So the synoptic map concept actually evolves out of the disciplinary changes in, in geography around about 1800 and the rise of a new field called the history of discovery after the 1780s. Um, and it's adopted by traditional map historians starting in the 1830s, the, the, the beginnings of map history. Then the concrete map concept, which holds that um, maps are properly based on territorial surveys or topographical surveys like USGS, Ordnance Survey, so on. Um, that starts to develop after 1800. It becomes the core of academic cartography as that field starts to develop after 1870, 1880, and <clears throat> using an internal map history as a way to um, educate students about the nature of map and map making. Um, by the 1880s, this idea of a concrete map had actually also included, come to include even world maps um, as being properly based on surveyed uh, information as opposed to uh, where are, here we go surveyed map which is really the the surveyed maps of maps of the earth based on plane geometry um yes a bit more complex than that but we're talking about all the different kinds of um detailed kinds of mapping mapping of property, mapping of place, engineering mapping, urban mapping, territorial mapping, all of which uh, have not been studied by other kinds of map historians. They're not studied by acad uh, academic cartographers, uh, although the territorials are, uh, certainly not by traditional map historians. Notice that choreographical sort of breaks the, the boundaries of the prototypes of the, of the categories in both surveyed and synoptic 
um, choreographical mapping, regional mapping is very much sort of on the threshold of both synoptic and surveyed kinds of maps. And then finally, you have um, the abstract map concept that starts to develop within academic cartography after 1900, especially in the work of people like Max Eckert. Um, and it becomes, thanks to Arthur Robinson, the core of uh, academic cartography after 1945, and a new kind of internal map history um, that Robinson and his students and others um, pursue, in which maps are, abstract maps are created by, actively created by people to have a message. Uh, very important point. And eventually you can put them all together. <laughs> and they all make some sort of sense. But they're still even together. This, so so this, would, this represents in a way all the different kinds of maps studied by map historians and map scholars uh, through uh, 19th, much of the 20th century um, and how these different kinds of, of map overlap in various ways. This is where half the book is, is, is trying to elucidate these overlaps and trying to understand the, the significance of them. But you'll notice um, that there's no space in, in this diagram for geodetic mapping, mapping of the size and shape of the earth and nothing for celestial mapping. Uh, in fact, there's a great article in 1970 by the Austrian cartographer, Eric Einberger, where he's basically talking about what is cartography. And the very first thing he does is says, well, we're going to cut out the survey stuff. Oh, yeah, and ignore all the celestial mapping. That's just irrelevant to what we're interested in. Clearly consciously bracketing uh, the map to be a certain kind of work. Which brings me to my last section. Um, the complexities of the post-World War II era, which is where I am now. Um, I'm having a great deal of fun in this whole process, I can assure you. The kicker uh, has been that as we move forward in the 20th century, uh, starting in the, in, especially in the depression, um, but really kicking into gear during World War II, there is a, a concern for um, what can be called directed communication. Uh, this ranges from, you know, the US federal government telling farmers in the, in the 30s, hey, hey guys, this is how you should feel, plow your fields to cut down on soil erosion. Um, all the way to kind of maps on the left, very overtly um, political uh, propaganda, what you might to use a Russian, call, call it agitprop, uh, to, to talk about the, the very political nature of it. And on the right, also from 1940, is one of one set of, of uh, other images from uh, Fortune magazine by Richard Eads Harrison. These kinds of um, of this interest in directed communication uh, covered everywhere from, from behavioral psychology uh, to geography into sociology. After the war, it leads to the formation of communication studies allied to advertising, for example, uh, heavily funded by advertising for that matter. Um, academic cartographers buy into this. This is, this is where the communication models of academic cartography come from. Cartographers have a, a particular aspect to this whole process, which, which I won't get into. Just, it's, it's just fun. It's what I've been writing about most recently. Um, but ultimately, what this, this, this kind of um, other kind of mapping gets very popular. Richard D. Harrison's work in particular becomes very, very popular. And you end up with... Um, a sharp distinction being drawn between, in effect, two new map concepts that are, that are actually defined in opposition to each other. None of those earlier map concepts were really defined in, in opposition, although abstract, concrete to some degree. Um, now what happens 
there is a celebration, as it were, of the alternative map as it as it proliferates, as it becomes more popular, as it imbues public discourse, as the opposite of what is called various ways, formal, official, I call them normative maps. You've got the factual, this is what the world is kind of map, as opposed to the more fun, hey, let's show the world in a new way for new meanings to, to communicate interesting positions. Um, so uh, Buckminster Fuller's Dymaxion map, also from the September 1940 issue of Virtue magazine, uh, versus a standard Rand McNally kind of thing. So, and I'm just going to reiterate that these new map concepts are coming into play even at the same time as those older four map concepts are still existing and still pertinent to map historians and map scholars. Um, this is not a simple process. Um, for many academics, um, including people like Waldo Tobler, you know, Dean of, of the mathematical analytical cartographers, um, these kinds of alternative maps stand as authentic indications of individuals quote mental maps mental maps is a concept um, popularized by uh, behavioral psychologists after the war and it's a very loose indeterminate concept and it embraces both personal individual understandings of space and cultural understandings of space they're quite different kinds of to my mind quite different things but they get collapsed together uh, and so you end up with these kinds of maps, these quote anamorphic, you know, without structure maps as being symbolic of emblematic of how people actually think about space. Actually, you know, in a way, um, these kinds of maps prompt the, the, the argument that in fact, all maps are quote, mental maps, all maps, including our most scientific maps, are part and parcel of human nature and are created by humans for humans in accordance with our mental concepts. So where I am right now, and this is going to be my last slide, um, where I am right now is trying to unpick uh, these various concepts. So in a way, we've got normative versus alternative, two map concepts that get created in a rhetorical argument about the nature of maps, the nature of knowledge, the nature of how humans understand space that lead to what I'm calling, uh, for want of anything else, the anthropogenic map concept. The idea that all maps are human made, anthropogenesis. All maps are flawed and cannot be mimetic by definition. There's a sense running through the post-war period um, of, a, of this sort of a, 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 an aggrieved realization, uh, a sense of betrayal, in, as one person puts it, that the normative map cannot be true, that even the best normative map has distortions, that what the map shows is not exact, it is not perfect. As a map maker, I find this a very silly idea um, as a map student, but you find it throughout the 40s, uh, right up into the present. Um, I'm actually, I, I, just, I just added a couple of quotes from the line, from recent publications just within the last year, uh, in which people are complaining about, well, real maps are, are, are wrong. They, they mislead us, they betray us. Um, and so in that kind of concept, there's this, this tension, almost a dialectic between normative and alternative map concepts has issued forth this further concept um, that is what underpins sociocultural map history, the kind of map history um, that Woodward and Hardy championed, that I've championed, and that has been so productive and so prolific. Um, 
the kicker for me, and this is really the, the last part of the book, is that the sociocultural map history is actually rooted in what is frankly the final culmination of the ideal of cartography. The ideal of cartography insists that there is one kind of map um, and the anthropogenic map concept has finally created that. All things that could even be, be remotely called maps are maps within this, this, this concept. It is a completely broad, unwieldy, uh, ahistorical, anyway, again, all sorts of things. It's also very much um, caught up with the, um, what Martin Bruckner called the maps are bad syndrome, which takes the normative concept as being what cartography is and bends that out of shape for political reasons. So this is where I'm at, trying to understand how social cultural map history, everything that we do, most everything we do since 1980, is itself flawed because it's relying upon a map concept that comes out from the 50s, 60s, 70s, that we then have sought to justify based on our readings of Foucault or Latour or whoever. Um, and it still binds us into the ideal of cartography as a singular universal endeavor. Um, and hopefully we'll get away from that. So thank you. I'll shut up now and do questions. Thanks, Matthew. Um, we do. Uh, we'll run till about. We'll run till about one ten. Um, folks are more than welcome to drop off when they need to or want to during this longer lunch. Um, Matthew, I'm going to start pulling some some questions from the chat, um, sure. and people are welcome to drop questions in. And while I do that, I'll I'll ask a very simple question that I see right in front of me from David Weaver, asking if you yourself have ever made a map. Yes. Um, I went to university convinced I was going to become a land surveyor. And so I took, I went to a course which had like a half of my electives could be land surveying. So I did all the land surveying for that. Um, and I make maps for my own books. So, yes. So Melissa Chavez would like to know, um, how are scholars today decolonizing the study of maps? What are some of the things that you're seeing that are related to this? I'm going to give you an answer that um, amazed a class I gave uh, at Dartmouth a couple of months ago. Um, you know, obviously, there's all this work around counter mapping, which is, say, giving mapping technologies to, into the hands of indigenous people so they can map their own territories or conversely trying to map indigenous conceptions of space within um, modern mapping techniques. There's um, simply trying to um, uh, preserve, resurrect um, indigenous ways of mapping. But the key thing for me is to decenter the map. Um, and this is one of the issues around, well, what is map history? <laughs> if, if you don't know how to define what a map is. Um, for us, we, we've evolved a sense of map history around a thing that is the focal point. And we think about maps as things. We think of them as graphic, as objects. What we need to do is set back and think about the work that the map does in the communities that are making and consuming the maps. And when you do that, you start to realize that um, there are not only are there different kind of map mapping modes, but that the map itself doesn't have to be um, an object, that the bounds of a map, even of a, of a Print the intellectual boundaries of a map aren't limited to the piece of paper it's on or screen it's on. Um, and so by decentering the map in our studies, we can actually understand what work maps do. What work is productive in a post-colonial sense? What work is not productive in a post-colonial sense? Um, so for me, the question is, 
focus more on um, on mapping the processes of producing, circulating, consuming particular kinds of maps rather than the map as some kind of universal thing we can all point to and say, oh, that's a map. But in reality, nah, I can't. Hope that helps. Matthew, I think I muted you when I was trying to unmute myself. Sorry. So you're going you to have to That's there okay. Um, another question from a map cataloging perspective that um, Lena brings to us is, do you have any thoughts um, on the role of all this, what you were talking about today, in map cataloging vocabularies used by library workers? Hi, Lena. Yes, of course you'd ask that question. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, one of the things I would I would say is you don't have to, this is coming out of the last book, you don't have to religiously slavishly record a representative fraction one to X for every single map that you catalog because it's a thing that only created in 1803. Um, it doesn't pertain to maps made before 1803. Um, anyway, that's just a side. But yeah, in terms of the kinds of maps that are made, um, and this is where the third book is going to get really into, into huge detail. Um, I've already talked at length in various places about the different modes of mapping. Um, that there are, you know, property maps are different from, place maps are different from, uh, terrain maps are different from, geographical, from marine, from celestial, and so on. Uh, is how we structured the last three volumes of the history of cartography uh, around these discrete mapping modes. And it would be very, very useful in, in cataloging uh, realms to catalog maps in collections by the, at least the broad modes, if not more, more precise uh, sub modes or, or discursive threads, call them what you will. Um, that these maps represent in, in some way. And the problem there though, is that uh, the look of the map, the form of the map is not a purely useful guide to identifying the mode it was created within. Um, the world map by Deline from uh, Dieppe I showed earlier, looks like a marine map, is made like a marine map, but it's a geographical map of the world. Um, you know, marine style, shall we say? Um, so there, 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 are, there are issues there, shall we say? But there's that's just the first level. I'm sure there's catalogers will come up with far more nuanced uh, changes to the cataloging systems. Another question out there for you, Matthew, from Carla. Hey, Carla. Who is asking, what about early artistic maps that represent ideas on spaces, places, and territories, spatial relationships, geopolitical issues, processes? Um, do these not also qualify to be conceptualized as maps? And she means in a more elaborate way than the simplified ideal of pictorial map. Are they oh, absolutely. Map? Absolutely. So, um... But the key thing for me is that um, it's not enough just to say, hey, we've got all these alternative kinds of maps. That's just falling into the normative alternative map concept again. Is to understand the very precise circumstances in which these, these things were made and used. Um, one thing I, 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 I didn't talk here about, um, one of the things in Jeremy Smith's book, all the way back to the beginning, um, that for him was just a throwaway comment. It was just a statement that is so uncontroversial, he didn't have to justify it, or, or it was just standard linguistic uh, consensus. Um, that just made me go, whoa, I gotta rethink this. Um, and that was the statement that the users of a system, linguistic system, um, are all users of the system, whether you are reading or speaking, uh, listening or writing, um, whether you're producing or consuming, making or using in the traditional terms of map studies, you're all sharing in a certain linguistic system. 
And so the traditional divide between the map maker and the map user, where the map maker is the person who defines the meaning of the map, and then the map user who then just absorbs this map in some way, um, which is a, 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 a dichotomy that, that runs deep in academic cartography, that is completely irrelevant. Um, the people who are using maps are bound to the people who are producing them and vice versa. It's, it's part of a network. That's why circulation is to me really, really important. So yeah, so you've got all these maps that, that, that Libby uh, enumerated from, from Carla's comment, which I haven't seen, I can't find it. Um, and you could say, yeah, those are all alternative maps. Those are all non-normative. They don't adhere to the idea of mimetic representation and blah, blah, blah. Um, but more precisely, how does each of those maps have a history? How does each of those maps circulate from their producers to their, to their consumers? And how are those consumers reading them and contributing to the system of um, the semantic system, shall we say, that, that undergirds a very particular spatial discourse? Um, so, it, so essentially what I'm arguing, and this will be the third book, is that it's not enough just to say, hey, there are alternative maps you've got to study. It's we've got to give histories to those maps. That actually comes back to the whole post-colonial thing. Um, in this book, I, I use the example of Urban Royce, who um, 1938 reproduced a, an, an ancient Chinese map, unquote. Um, there was actually a redrawing of a 1902 from a, of, a, of a map discussed in 1902 article or a ancient Chinese map by a, a missionary come journalist in Korea. And fortunately that initial article by, Hul by Hulbert um, has a photograph of the map, but nowhere does, that, does Hulbert talk about where the map came from, um, when it was produced, where it was produced is just held up as being, this is so contrary to what we think of as Western maps and it's all written in Chinese. Therefore, it is a ancient Chinese map that has no history. It just stands for a entire civilization's world concept across all time, um, which you could then compare. Royce could then compare with the rather similar Roman map from which was dated because Romans have a history to about one fifty. Uh, CE or 50 CE, sorry, Pomponius Miller. Um, anyway, so Royce's image gets, has been reproduced by Henriksen, by Word, by Thrower, a bunch of people at various times, calling it the Chinese map. Yeah, it's a 19th century woodblock printed in Korea. It is a distinctly Korean map form that, uh, called a Chosun, that has that it has a history that we need to understand and illuminate. Unfortunately, scholars are now doing that. Uh, Richard Pegg, in, in particular, for this map. So the goal then becomes to um, take maps that are otherwise um, assumed to be one thing because we have a map concept that we're fitting everything into or excluding stuff from. And instead trying to figure out what, okay, so how do these things actually work? How do they, how do they function? Um, and to what end? In what contexts? At what times? Um, so you end up with, okay, indigenous mapping. Indigenous mapping in one society is not the same over time. So um, what were you know, pre-colonial indigenous maps? Can we reconstruct those in a, um, even if they're just um, oral, maybe some, some marking of landscapes all the way through and kinds of indigenous mapping being produced through colonial contact into the present as indigenous groups are trying to reclaim land as trying to reclaim their presence in space. Um, so these are all very interesting questions. Um, this is the question of trying to figure out um, 
to understand the history of these of these things, whether they are graphic, whether they're verbal, whether they're built in the landscape, and frequently and performative, and how do they these different strategies interplay within the same kind of mapping? I'm ranting. Sorry. It's all right. I'll ask just two more questions. Um, one that will sort of be a prelude to our upcoming exhibition at the um, at the map library, which will be both in person and online, asking about fantasy maps. So Jim St. Pierre wants to know where do fantasy maps, like maps of Middle Earth, say, um, fit into your Venn diagram? Right. So fantasy maps are, um, generally speaking, they're synoptic maps. They they are works that purport to show the geographical knowledge of a region. The region doesn't actually exist, but hey, who, who cares? It's still a synoptic kind of map. Um, what happens, it gets interesting. There's, a, there's, a, there's a, a, a move in the 19th century to make maps of fantasy places known. Uh, Stevenson's map of Treasure Island I mean, immediately springs to mind of, um, of fictitious places, but to do so in a modern factual kind of way. But at the very end of the century, into the 20th century, um, as the uh, industrialization is leading all sorts of aesthetic changes, um, you have more fantastical maps being created, but nonetheless drawing on the same uh, conventions of normal mapping. What then happens that I find fascinating, and this would be a, this might be a future topic if I actually get back into the archive, is to is is how in the World War One 1920s era, uh, with the rise of Art Deco and modernism, the the idea of having fun with real with with map conventions to map fantasy places gets turned into mapping real places in a fantastic way. That's a, that's a really interesting inversion and it happens somewhere around about 1920, say 1914, 1925 in that, in that period. Um, and it's really intriguing to me how, th how that happens. Um, so I'm not saying, I should also back up, the, the, I'm not trying to say Here's a scheme that will fit how every kind of map ever made will be fitted into. What I'm trying to get at is a scheme of how have different groups of map scholars, and whether map historians or academic cartographers, how have they bracketed the map in very particular ways um, in order to write narratives of Western civilization, narratives of professional development, um, no narratives, the substantives, I'm afraid. Um, they're just interested in a map at the time. Uh, how, how, are, how are scholars defining the map? Um, and how are, they imp how are they doing that by engaging in map history to create a, a, a sense of the synoptic map, the abstract survey, con concrete, and so on. Um, I'm not, this is, this is very much a, uh, an intellectual construction game. It's not a, hey, here's a map, it's of this kind. <laughs> that's a different project. That's, that's book three. <laughs> I think people will be anxiously awaiting both. Thank you for everyone who hung out with us today for Monday Thank Math you. Lunch. We have definitely reached the time. Thank you to Matthew. There are some more questions in the chat. I am saving the chat to pass along to Matthew. So don't worry about that. He will he will get those. Um, and I just wanted to uh, wish everyone a wonderful week and happy end of November. We will be taking a pause on Monday Math Lunch in December, and we will be back together in January. Um, thanks so much, and we will see you next time. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Libby. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>